for this morning's session is Dr. Omar Danner. He comes to us from the Morehouse School of Medicine. He's where he's the Chief of Surgery, and he'll be talking to us about the urine review and surgical and burn critical care. Thank you, mate. Okay, good. Yes, I think it is. Uh, good morning, and first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Martin, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Najro, and the Southeast uh, Critical Care uh, Summit Committee uh, for inviting me. I want to thank all you guys for being here. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about surgery and uh, pretty much burns and year in the review. And you know, the issue with surgical critical care, a lot of it overlaps everything that's being said. So for the sake of not being redundant, some things I'm going to blow through really quickly, some things are going to touch on and reinforce some of the points that are made. But uh, again, not to belabor a point, uh, have no financial disclosures. The first thing I want to do is just kind of touch about, talk about something that's in the realm of surgery and then quickly deviate away from that. But one of the things that we face in our realm of trauma and critical care is patients who have basically rib fractures, flail chest, and a lot of times we end up having to deal with this. And how we manage them, particularly when you're dealing with non-conservatively uh, or basically traditionally, the thing is sometimes they don't do nearly as well and so there's a constant debate of you know, how do we go about managing them? So, you know, in 2012, uh, Batar and colleagues actually addressed this issue and they looked at basically rib fracture uh, fixation as a means of stabilizing the chest wall. And they created this conversation whereby basically, you know, again, operating for chest wall fractures, trying to prevent pneumonia, decreasing vent days, is this effective? And what they basically found was that it, although surgery for this actually cost more upfront, it did actually increase their uh, overall pain control. It basically shortened their length of stay, and actually it was actually more cost effective. So that set on this kind of several year journey of trying to act, answer, is surgical fixation of rib fractures better or not? So there are multiple studies that followed. But one of the other things is, you know, even when you don't have an immediate benefit, you know, does it actually improve outcomes? And even when they set it to zero, it actually showed that it did. So they actually did a, another study to kind of look at all the different trials that came out in those uh, subsequent trials by Shermer. And what they found is when they looked at these randomized trials that the biggest thing is that vent days were decreased, the pneumonia rate was actually improved, you get better pulmonary clearance, yet decreased ICU length of stay by five days, and the treatment costs were about $10,000, but there was no significant uh, reduction in mortality. Most patients who have broken ribs, who develop pulmonary contusions, who develop pneumonia, actually don't die, they just have increased cost, increased lengths of stay. And so it was basically shown to be none inferior, but there are a lot of patient benefits with opioid epidemic raging. This becomes important as a treatment modality to help get them off of this. So that's why I bring this up as something to consider in your treatment armamentarium. Another thing that we deal with in the realm of surgery and particularly trauma, uh, but throughout, you know, I think all services is the patient who has none uh, compressible truncal hemorrhage. Particularly after blunt trauma, this is a significant issue because this could cause death before we have time to intervene. So a group in Maryland actually, uh, as opposed to the traditional way of addressing the hypotensive patient with, hype, with a truncal, or non-compressible truncal hemorrhage, uh, which is thoracotomy with cross-clamping of the distal thoracic aorta, they actually embarked on placing an intra-aortic balloon pump to basically create an internal occlusion of the aorta, now called Reboa, and resuscitated those patients. And what they found is in those 31 patients that the basic thing is that it was effective and none inferior to um, the traditional thoracotomy. Therefore, uh, the AAST, which is one of our major trauma uh, Society of the American Association for Surgery or Trauma actually created an aorta registry and studied this looking at eight centers, 114 patients. And basically what they found is that although, let me see if this pointer works. So is that in patients who were hypotensive but didn't require CPR, that these patients actually had an improvement in mortality but still not to the point where you could say that 
Rabua was superior, so there was a trend, but it wasn't actually a definitive, uh, you know, st uh, statistically significant uh, change from the traditional th uh, thoracotomy. When you do thoracotomies, they increase the morbidity, they increase chest wall pain, and it adds to the morbidity in these situations. And again, I want to talk a little bit about why is this important to us. Well, the first thing is that establishing this modality as a treatment for those difficult bleeds becomes an important modality. And so they looked at it again and basically the bottom line in a meta-analysis proved that it actually was actually effective and probably in a more powerful trial it may even show a benefit. In another study, I'm going to skip through this real quickly, this is just another study just reinforcing it. The big thing is, and this is what I want to talk about particularly as it relates to us, that sometimes we see patients who are not trauma who have these uh, bleeds. And so it actually started getting expanded outside of the realm of trauma. This is patients with abruptio placenta, morbid adherent placentas. There are several trials that were looked at in Europe. And basically what they found is that these uh, Rebora procedures, put the balloon in these patients who have abruptio placenta, actually decreased the amount of blood, it decreased the amount of complications which, you know, again, we have patients who have GI bleeds. There are other types of bleeds that this can be extended to, so have an idea that this type of therapy exists. Another thing that was interesting in the study that these catheters, which is actually a femoral line placed through the femoral artery, actually can be placed by interventional radiologists, by emergency medicine physicians, can, can be extended to other critical care attending, so adding things to the armamentarium, this may be a way to temporize that GI bleed that you're consulted on in the emergency room that's brought up to the MICU. And again, a lot of times they're kind of crashing and burning in the middle of the night, and we need, you know, somebody to kind of help temporize this until either you get surgical intervention or the gastroenterologist there to basically stop the bleed. So again, just knowing that that's available. The other thing that I want to talk about is uh, just in the realm of burns, you know, trying to figure out kind of who's going to be sick. A lot of time we use age as a criterion, and it's actually very difficult because we know age is just a number, and the physiology of the patient actually has a lot more to, uh, does a lot more to determine the patient's outcome or uh, basically disposition at the end of their care. So there was a study looking at the validation of emergency general surgery frailty scoring. Dr. Martin did a good job talking about all the different scoring systems, but frailty scoring is something that's becoming important as our population is aging. And so they looked at it in the burn population, first by looking at 100 patients, and 34 of the patients uh, were determined to be frail. They used this to compare it to the other group, their study group, prospectively. And basically what they found is that patients classified as uh, frail had statistically more complications, none home discharges, ICU admissions, longer ICU stays, and in hospital mortalities. So as we're trying to figure out how to stratify these patients who come to the MICU, to the burn unit, to the surgical ICU, there's a lot of extrapolatability of this, but trying to find that ideal scoring system is still a moving target for a lot of us. So further study is going to have to be done, but the abbreviated uh, emergency general surgery frailty index equally predicted morbidity and mortality in burn patients and basically helped in planning. So when we talk about resource utilization and counseling of the family, this becomes uh, something that may have some utility. Uh, this is just a chart kind of showing the same thing. Um, the basically, the la next thing we want to talk about was, particularly as the opioid epidemic is raging, that finding ways to start decreasing our opioid and sedative use. This is an interesting study looking at the use of continuous ketamine as an analgesic. This has become increasingly popular in the emergency medicine setting. Uh, so this study looked at, uh, is a retrospective analysis from 2011 to 2017, and basically looked at patients who were on uh, analgesic and sedative drips. They found that in their study, in these patients who met inclusion criteria, although it was a small study, that they were able to wean off both the fentanyl or the narcotic drip and the uh, propofol. In addition, they were actually able to wean the patient with ketamine alone, which means that, uh, again, this gives us something else in our treatment armamentarium as we're trying to get people off narcotics. Some people don't tolerate them as well. 
In a, but however, there were two patients who kind of had agitation and had to go off of it. This is a small study, but it, it's something else to think about in the treatment of these patients who are in the ICU on the vent having pain and pain syndromes. But this study highlights the, the viability of using continuous ketamine infusion as an adjunct to the analgesia and on mechanically ventilated burn patients. And I think this is extrapolatable, uh, particularly in surgery and trauma. We're starting to use it a little more. Uh, and I think that it could be used in the medical ICU setting as well. Another thing is, uh, again, we talked about fluid suppressors and trying to figure out, you know, who needs suppressors, particularly in burn patients, is difficult. A lot of these patients are getting primarily, you know, fluid resuscitation, usually with crystalloid after you exceed a certain level uh, for cc's per kilo uh, times the percentage burn, we start switching over to colloid resuscitation with albumin. It, historically, the, al the albumin is mixed in normal saline. I think, uh, you know, Dr. Bender and Dr. Connor has done a good job of talking about hyperchloremia. The risk of hyperchloremia has become very popular as a potential risk factor in kind of morbid or uh, critically ill patients. And so in the patients, in the retrospective analysis and people who had large burns, what they found was that administering saline-based albumin actually led to worsening acidosis or due to the hypochloremia, and this may potentially worsen outcomes. So they uh, basically, after they did their initial study, changed to using a fluid with half normal saline as the base. And what they found is that in those patients who got half normal saline and albumin, 5% albumin, actually no longer developed acidosis. So it's something else to think about even, I know Dr. Martin's been studying albumin as a treatment modality, but kind of adding this to the thought process is one of the things that I want to do because this is becoming popular in the ICU uh, and, not, and thinking about the base of the fluids is something else that we can all basically benefit from in helping our patients uh, by not making them more acidotic. Uh, in this population, in predicting this, the only thing that was actually found to be a significant predictor of who goes on vasopressors is actually, um, is actually um, age, age greater than 55. So we have patients who may need vasopressors who basically, you know, again, we're trying to figure out who to start on and who to stop. The thing is that it's very hard to predict who's going to do it and, you know, Decreased time to reestablishing adequate perfusion actually leads to worse kind of outcome, worse uh, organ failure. So again, the only thing that was actually found to be st statistically significant was age greater than 55. But all these things tied together that in older patients, starting presses early is important. In patients who you're resuscitating who require albumin, basically using decreased uh, amounts of like pure normal saline becomes important. And so all these in the end will help us as we're trying to take care of the sick population of patients. So I want to basically kind of end by just saying thanks for the opportunity to be here because I think from a surgical perspective, again, I think more surgeons should actually be here. I think that there's a lot that we learn by kind of talking about, you know, all the different things. Uh, particularly in the resuscitation and all the, you know, from vet management to the neural management. And in the end, I think that we can continue to learn from each other. So I think the, in the kind of closing, the last thing I want to talk about was another thing that uh, is coming up in the burn arena, and that is the incorporation of high dose vitamin C, limiting the amount of fluids. Dr. Carter did a good job of talking about this. Is, you know, given excessive amounts of fluid, you know, been shown, particularly crystalloids, to worsen the outcome. This was one study that I thought was interesting, looking at high-dose vitamin C. And patients who get, in these burn patients who got high-dose vitamin C in a nurse-driven protocol were actually shown to actually get decreased fluids. In fact, there was a deviation from actually needing to do the traditional fluid resuscitation. And so anything that we can do to advance the care of our patients mitigate against harm, I think, is actually advantageous. And so what they showed was that there was a decrease in the total resuscitation volume in the protocolized patients, which, again, uh, may be something that benefits in other areas. And I think that uh, it's something that needs further study because the population was very small. 
So that being said, this chart doesn't show anything. It's just kind of showing the same thing. But uh, again, I want to just thank everybody uh, for being here. And I want to stop right here and see if there's any questions.